Backpack Broadcasting continues to bring you the best original sports content, but now you can get more of the content you love. For as little as $3 a month, you can get access to bonus content, including behind the scenes footage and interviews from the Sports Walk, Sideline Stories, or the Ain't Hard to Tell podcast. All this exclusive content comes via Patreon. There are tiered levels of patronage, and each Backpack Broadcasting patron receives exclusive perks. Your support helps Backpack Broadcasting create more of the original content that you love. Visit Backpack Broadcasting's Patreon page and become a patron today. Podcast episode 197. Dexter Henry, Brian Fonseca here. Hopefully, everybody out there is doing fine. Now, if you're listening to this at the end of this week, you know that we usually come to you once a week on a Tuesday. But a couple times we've maybe done two episodes in a week. This is one of these weeks that calls for it. Yeah. A lot of things <laughs> going on in the world of sports that I think we needed to talk about. It absolutely needed to be addressed. There was no way that we could not address this. And I feel like as people who have voices, and that word will come up again in this conversation, (laughs) have voices, and we try to take our use of our platform seriously, and for the cultures and people that we represent, I think it was upon us to talk about some things especially how these two things relate to public health and also racism, misogyny, homophobia. We're going to get into that today. All right, so if you want to talk about let's let's start with the first thing. It starts in my home borough of Brooklyn, New York, where the Brooklyn Nets point guard Kyrie Irving was told by the Nets earlier this week that he would not be with the team basically he would not be playing because he still has not complied with the vaccine mandate in new york the nets basically said and i'm paraquoting here they would not have him as a part-time player meaning Kyrie would only play road games and that's were like nope this is not what we're going to do and b i don't know how you feel about this but yeah you do <laughs> you're right you're right this is one of these things i have to act like i don't know i do know and i think for me it's pretty simple. I love what the Nets did here. Either mm-hmm. you're all in or you're not. Now, there's another argument to be made and things I could talk about. I think the league as a whole should have had a, a vaccine mandate. There should be no gray area for this. Everybody should get it in the interest of everybody's public health, blah, blah, blah. Brian and I have talked about how we're tired of people saying that this is a personal decision when it is a public health decision. Mm-hmm. And as I've said before, I believe it was on the podcast we did a couple podcasts ago called the miseducation of uh, NBA anti-vaxxers. This talk that we hear from athletes across any sport, I'm here for the team, down for the team. We are all together. We're in this in the brotherhood. The best ability, uh, best ability, excuse me, is availability. You hear that all the time. The best ability is availability. You know what the net said? Kyrie can't be available for us all the time. We are paying him this much amount of money, and he's only going to play half the games. And what is he not taking the vaccine for? I mean, nobody still still really knows the answer here. Like, nobody knows. We'll get to the sort of answer that we got. But, Brian, I know how you feel about this. And look, I think the Nets did the right thing here. They absolutely did the right thing. It had to be done. There's no if, ands, or buts about it. And now the move is on Kyrie. We're going to see what is Kyrie going to do. Is he going to go get this jab before the season starts? Is he not? It's going to be very, very interesting. But I think the longer it goes on where he's away of the team, guys are going to be sick of this. They may not say it publicly, but Kevin Durant, James Harden, they got to be sick of this. This, this. this is not good for a team that has championship aspirations and many people consider to be the favorite. And I'm going to say this one last thing before I let you go, B. I've said it before. Kyrie's actions on this and anybody's actions on this where they're not going to protect themselves or the people around them in the place they work is selfish. There's nothing else to say but that. 
it is absolutely positively selfish. And I saw some people out there on Twitter talking about, oh, well, Kyrie has done this and that and all this charitable work, and so he can't be selfish. Yo, two things can be true, people. Kyrie could have done all that work, and that's great. And in this instance, when it comes to public health and his team that he says he's a part of, he can't absolutely be selfish. And the Nets did the right thing because if it's really about team and it's really about being united and it's really about the brotherhood, then everybody has to be together on the ship towards the goal of getting a chip. Has to happen. If that doesn't happen, then there is no team. Right now, for Kyrie Irving, it seems like there is an I in team. <sighs> yeah, uh, I think he's a rebel without a cause, which is a common phrase from well, a lot of uh, <laughs> rap songs that we've heard from back in the day where they would mm-hmm. kind of say it in a braggadocious way, but I think this applies here to Kyrie Irving. Um, man without a country, I guess is another way that you could sort of phrase that. That, that may work. You could go there as well. But, you know, I think that uh, he thinks he's a martyr and he's not. He's simply not because, like, I understand that even Jesus had his haters. Uh, but just because you're alone on something doesn't mean every single other person is wild necessarily, especially in this case when your allies are like Donald Trump Jr. and Ted Cruz. And uh, people of, uh, of 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 that sort of mindset who wouldn't back Kyrie Irving on a bunch of the other things he's done charitably, right? I think that ha- that can't be overlooked here. And they're just doing that because it's a platform for them to sort of use this black athlete to strengthen whatever their cause is. It's not really out of care for Kyrie Irving. Like, I doubt that Kyrie Irving's being contacted behind the scenes by some of these people who claim to be allies of his that he's seemingly created through his actions. And I think that it's irresponsible for him, you know, to sort of, you know, talk the way he's talked or not really talk. But uh, the way he's handled this publicly is I think has been irresponsible at the end of the day. I think that uh, a lot of people, you know, look up to this guy, like I've said on the last NBA exchange, Ain't Hard to Tell podcast crossover. Like this is somebody who sells a lot of sneakers sells a lot of merchandise kids look up to him he's very flashy they love his handle maybe the best ball handling skills we've ever seen that plays on youtube and you know um just social media in general and kids look up to that and therefore like like it or not you're a role model dude you're very influential you're one of the most influential influential basketball players that we've had over the last 10 years 10 years ago was when he left duke and uh, enter the NBA draft where he was the number one overall pick. And I think that as far as, you know, the way the Nets handled this, this is correct. This is a workplace issue. This is not even just a personal choice or a public health thing. It's also a workplace issue because there are trainers who are vaccinated, who have to be vaccinated and chose to get this vaccine, who are going to be in contact with you and be, and you're not vaccinated. So obviously your chances of contracting COVID uh, raise up. And then all of a sudden, like there's a spread a trainer has to go back, take it back to their family. You never know what can sort of happen here. Like there are a lot of variables at play. It's not just about I'm standing on my own too. And I'm just going to, you know, do this because I'm looking out for, what did he tell Shams Dex that he was looking out for, you well, know, some of the people that were forced to get vaccinated. Otherwise they couldn't like leave their jobs. And it's like, yeah, we, uh, as people, like we all, have been vaccinated because we've had to be. That's how some of these other things like mumps, measles, chicken pox isn't really a thing anymore the way it used to be. Um, Polio. Polio. Like, we've all gotten vaccines very young because of these things. COVID is something that maybe we'll look back one day many years from now and be like, yo, remember when people got COVID? Remember? Because we're probably going to have to... Shit. You and I, Dex, well, me specifically, because Simi's already five, but when I have children and I plan to have children, like they're probably going to need to get COVID vaccines very early because at that point, it's like, oh, we don't want this COVID to come back, assuming that we're out of it by that point. And hopefully we will be because I don't plan on having a child anytime soon. Uh, And I'm probably more responsible about that than Kyrie's being here. So (laughs) I just think that, you know, he's bugging out and I do think that he'll eventually will get vaccinated. I do think his his boys are going to get to him, but I love the 
this is how it should be because this is a very this is the most important season that they're about to embark on in franchise history, potentially their first NBA championship. They haven't won a title of any kind since the ABA, and they haven't been to the NBA finals in about 20 years. And this is serious. They have Kevin Durant in his prime. They have James Harden in his prime. Kevin Durant got an extension. James Harden is probably going to get his. Kyrie Irving was about to get his, and now it doesn't look like that's going to be on the table because of the erratic decision-making, and this is who he's been throughout the course of his career. And it's unfortunate because he does a lot of good things, but at the same time, you just can't rock with him on a lot of other causes. Some people have drawn comparisons to Kanye West. Some people have drawn comparisons to like all these other different people. And I think he's just bugging out. And I think the Nets handled this the right way, period. Yeah, I think they handled it the right way. I want to get real quickly into what you said about uh, what he talked to with uh, Sham Sharani about. There's some reporting from Shams, which... In an article, and I want to pull this up, it was t- it was called Kyrie Irving and his vaccine stance clarified why the Nets star has made a decision that will sideline him. And so I saw that headline and I said, OK, we're going to get some clarification. And then I read this article and realized I got no clarification at all whatsoever. I have no idea. I'm not any clearer on why he is making this stand. And the lead for this article from Sham said Kyrie Irving believes he is fighting for something bigger than basketball. And the unintended consequences is that his mission is conflicting with his career and his franchise, the Brooklyn Nets. Basically, as Brian said, Kyrie says that he is standing for the people who have lost uh, their jobs because of their refusal to take the vaccine or deal with vaccine ma- mandates. And quote, <laughs> and I want to find this quote. And hey, why would you want to stand up for those people, by the way? Like, why? Yeah, I don't even feel like those people need standing up for because those people have made a lot of noise in standing up about how they feel and yeah. why they're against vaccine mandates. This is a, a, a quote. It, this is what's read. Let me also read this. To him, this is about a grander fight than the one on the court. And Irving is challenging a perceived control of society and people's livelihood. According to sources with knowledge of, of Irving's mindset, it is a decision that he believes he is capable to make given his current life dynamics. <laughs> yeah, he is privileged to do that as a, right. as a multi-million dollar athlete. Like, he, it's a privilege to do that. And it shows how out of touch you are with people who actually, even if they wanted to think about, like, not taking the vaccine for whatever reason, but they have to because they need to eat, your privilege allows you to make this choice. And the fact that he's so out of touch with that is mind-blowing to me. Also, like, mind-blowing to me. additionally to that, Dex, having a choice, period, as far as this vaccine goes, is a privilege also because, you know, we know there are a lot of countries in the Caribbean, there are a lot of countries in Europe, elsewhere, whatever the case may be, Africa. They can't get this vaccine. They don't have access to vaccines, good vaccines, like legitimate ones. I was just talking to somebody where, like, their family who's out in the Dominican Republic, they're like, their family hasn't really gotten it yet because they're unable to get, like, really good, high-quality vaccines. We have multiple of them here on America, and a lot of our population is just like, eh, nah, personal choice, personal freedoms. Like, we're so privileged to the point where we don't even realize how privileged we are. And people like you and I, Dex, realize that because, I mean, we realized that long before these last four or five years <laughs> and seeing everything transpire on a grander scale. Like this is way more serious than just Kyrie Irving saying no to a vaccine. It goes way, way beyond that. And I think people are looking at this in a too simplistic way. Not many people. A lot of people are rocking with the Nets here as it should be. But there are a lot of people who are, 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 are a loud minority of people. I should be responsible and oh, say yeah. it that way. Who are just saying like, oh, you know, personal choice, and it's not I'm glad the you, case. I'm, I'm glad you said loud minority because when there is a loud minority, emphasis on the word loud, that means those people have a voice. But then came this quote: "Kyrie wants to be a voice for the voiceless." One source said. <laughs> so here's my thing: when I read that, I was just like, "Yo, what are we talking about?" Like one. <laughs> Even in this whole article by Shams, which is not Shams' fault. Like, I do not fault him for this. Kyrie's voice is nowhere in this article, right? There are other people speaking for him. My thing is, if you want to be a voice for the voiceless in anything, you got to speak. You got to say what it is that you stand for, right? There's nobody who's ever stood for anything that hasn't made their position clear on where they stand. We've talked about Colin Kaepernick on this podcast many times. Everybody knows where Colin Kaepernick stands and what he stood for, which is why we got annoyed when people tried to make it things that it was not, when he was very clear and articulated exactly what he was standing for. 
exactly what he was fighting against. So when people tried to make it something else, which was just a whole bunch of racism involved in that, that annoyed us. Kyrie's told us nothing. If you want to be a voice for the voiceless, Kyrie, you have a platform, just like we do here on this podcast. You have a platform that you can go to every press conference you do and you can preach your message of whatever it is that may be. You have social media where you can preach this message. Does anybody know what Kyrie's message is? Because I don't. He hasn't said anything. He hasn't said a damn thing at all. So don't give me this, you want to be a voice for the voiceless, but you won't use your voice. What the hell is that? What is that? <laughs> like, this is this is a joke. Could you imagine if some of the leaders, especially I'm saying this as a black person in this country, who fought for some of the freedoms that we had, said they wanted to be a voice for the voiceless, and yet they didn't speak? They didn't say anything? <laughs> and, and who was going to follow them? How can you be a leader? If you're going to be a leader, be about it. Even if you, even if I disagree with it, yeah. be about it. I can respect that. Look, we got on Andrew Wiggins. And Andrew Wiggins, like it or not, of what he said, and I thought a lot of what he said was ridiculous, but he stood in it. He's, he at least answered the question. He still got that jab, but he stood there and answered the question. Kyrie hasn't told us shit at all in any press conference. He tells us nothing. And now we get from a source he wants to be a voice for the voiceless? Are you kidding me? Right. And the last two things I'll say on this, both of which are silly because I got to throw in some silly shit here. Voice of the Voiceless, famously coined by CM Punk when he was, uh, you know, really taking a turn in this character and really becoming like a household name in the WWE. That was something that he said that he wanted to be, except he was doing that over the series of promos. He was actually lending voice to that while going against Vince McMahon, Triple H, Kevin Nash, et cetera, et cetera. This was 10 years ago. Uh, So, yeah. I, that made me laugh. Uh, Rob Lopez and I had a laugh over that. Shout out to Rob about Kyrie calling himself the voice of the voice. Shout out to Rob. And the other thing is some guy on Twitter, I forget who it is, one of these famous Republican conservatives that, like, you know, have some website that's well funded and whatever they get the attention of people. He said that, you know, Black Lives Matter isn't coming out and saying anything about Kyrie Irving being benched by a white guy. And what I'll say to that is this. Uh, the white guy who's the head coach for the Nets is Canadian. The GM is from New Zealand, and the owner is Asian. So it's a little bit different. <laughs> first of all, first, 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 first of all, like the stupidity of that statement is he's not being yeah. Like it's, so, it's, a white it's, guy. it's like such like, a apples to oranges. Or, it, it was thing. an organizational decision, which the team owner Joe Sai, an Asian man, and Sean Marks, who's from New Zealand, albeit a white man said that they were the ones who came to this decision together. Not Steve Nash. I'm sure Steve Nash was consulted on it, but they're the ones that, that said they came to He didn't to sound decision. like he disagreed. I, I, he, what, what's he going to say? He's not right. going to say that. So to act like he's been benching, that, see, those people are the same people that listen to Kaepernick, say for the reasons that he took a knee, was protesting, and they're the ones that turn into something else. That's what that person's trying to do. Yep. I'm not giving them any time of day on, on this. Like I'm not giving them any time of day where you're trying to force this into a racial issue and asking where Black Lives Matter is. You know where they are? Actually fighting injustice against Black people. That's what they're doing. Not worrying about Kyrie Irving not taking the vaccine. That is not what Black Lives Matter is about at all whatsoever. And, Thank and, you very much. And real quick, Dex, because I said that I think he does eventually bend and, and take it at some point. Do you think that he's also going to take it? Do you think that he's going to... Because I think he'll, he'll hold out for a while, but I do think that at some point he'll... he'll... Bro, bro. I don't know what to think about Kyrie because he's t- t- he doesn't say anything. Fair. He's voiceless. That's the lesson that should be learned here. He has been voiceless. You can't you, you you can't you can't have it both ways. He's trying to be a leader, but he's talking about being a voice for the voiceless when he is the one who has been voiceless. What's up, listeners and supporters of the Ain't Hard to Tell podcast? We need some help from you, and it won't take up too much of your time. As we grow, we always want to hear your feedback, so take a minute or two to fill out a short anonymous survey. The survey link is right in the episode notes for this podcast. It's easy and takes less than five minutes. As always, we thank you for your continued support. Well, the week before, you thought things were hot for Urban Meyer? <laughs> no, 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 no. Another coach came in and found himself in hot water probably the hottest waters we have seen in quite some time for NFL head coach. But I think for most people, if you listen to this podcast, you kind of know what we think. Is the NFL, are we that surprised? Not, 
not not really. Now, if you've been under a rock, you haven't heard former now former Raiders head coach John Gruden found himself, as I said, in hot water after there was an email that was leaked. And I should should be noted this email that was leaked came from an investigation of the Washington football team. If you remember, there were uh, several women, I believe it was seven women, that uh, filed a suit against the team saying that there was, you know, indiscretions and a toxic work culture and, and all the stuff. So the NFL was looking into it and out came about some emails from John Gruden in which he used a racial trope to describe D. Maurice Smith, the, um, I don't want to get his title wrong, the president of the NFL Players uh, Association. He is the head of it, the leader of that association. And he talked about, said that his lips were the size of Michelin lips. Excuse me, Michelin tires, pardon me. He said that his lips were the size of Michelin tires. And then Gruden tried to clean it up or apologize, I guess, but not really apologize and say that he usually uses the term rubber lips when he talks about people that's lying. Except I heard that and was like, that's not what you said. Like, it's not what you said. You talked about the size of a black man's lips. And for our brothers and sisters out there listening or watching who may not understand why that is a racial trope for years, and black people know this, and it is very old-timey racism, I guess you could say, where people will comment on our features, whether it's the size of our nose or the size of our lips. And, you know, they're just being corny herbs about it. So whatever, right? But it's like, damn, this is, what, this is, how, this is what you're doing, John Gruden? And we thought it was going to stop there. And there was talk about it over the weekend. Should there have been punishment against John Gruden? I thought there should have been some. I didn't think for that he should lose his job. I will note that this was an email that occurred in 2011. Then the water got hot right during Monday Night Football. New York Times article came out, which detailed even more ridiculous emails from John Gruden. And I should note that all these emails were, this is when John Gruden was an analyst uh, for ESPN and all through some time when he was head coach of the Raiders. But some of these emails were sent to NFL people, including Bruce Allen, who was the time head of the Washington football team, on work accounts, work email accounts. They actually sent this on work email accounts, people. They actually did this. Crazy. I mean, that's white privilege for you, though. Right? <laughs> this, this, this is how it goes. Because I mean, what? Well, that's that's a whole other topic for another day. But he sent this, and all this came out, and there were emails that involved misogyny, emails that involved wild homophobia, right? Talking about how the Rams shouldn't have drafted Michael Sam, uh, one of the first openly gay play, the first uh, NFL player not to play, but to be drafted, saying that he was openly gay, and. What's interesting enough is that Gruden, before he was fired, which obviously happened after all this, he was the head coach of the league's first active openly gay player. And so all this Carl happened. Nassib. In, yes, excuse me, Nat Nassib. Carl who, Nassib, who, yeah. Carl Nassib. Uh, in res- respect to him, who early in the week had to take a mental health day because of everything that was going on with this, and rightfully he should have. All this happened and unfolded, and it got even worse for Gruden. There also, and I should be noted, uh, talked about some of the misogyny here. There was also nude photos of women, some of who were Washington football team cheerleaders, sent among some of Gruden and other NFL leaders and people in positions of power. This is the kind of culture that was set. But I'd like this to be noted before I let Brian talk on this. I, I, first, when I saw this, I didn't think there was going to be any punishment for Gruden after the Zemo Reese Smith comments. I did not think that was going to happen because many times when stuff happens to black people, as what was said to Zemo Reese Smith, people are just like, whatever, right? All this other stuff came out. You knew he was done for. He resigned. Uh, I wish there was more of an example set for him and he had got fired, but that's not how it went down. However, this is where we are. And this is what's happened. And there's been a lot of talk, talk around this and how bad this is and what does it say about the league. Come on, folks. Is anybody shocked about this? Are we shocked that the people in power in the NFL would display levels of racism, homophobia, and misogyny? Like, no, it's not shocking. It's not shocking at all. It's not shocking at all when the NFL has shown for such a long period of time to not necessarily care about people. Now, what's jarring is this is a, a league where last year they were all in amidst the protests that we saw in this country last year, decided to put end racism in the end zone, right? 
and put and racism on the back of the helmets. But one of your head coaches is doing this. And I think there'll be a lot of talk about this, and we're talking this about this right now. But the question I want to put out there to the people and to Brian is, do we think after this anything is really going to change? There's more things that we can see come out of this email investigation, and there's more that we have seen. But is the culture really going to change? We have a lot of talks about how horrible this is, you know? And but and again, I'm going to be very square about this. When I say is anything going to change, this is not on minorities to change this. This is not on women to change this. This is right. not on members of the LGBTQ community to change this. This is on you white people in position of power. It's on y'all to change this, to say that, hey, we've had enough of this. This is wrong. This can't go down. We have to get rid of these people that are. Don't give me none of this crap about, oh, that was an email from 2011. Because that's what we saw first in the weekend, right, B? We saw people like, oh, this is an email from 2011. It's 10 mm-hmm. years ago, blah, blah, blah. While he was stuff, with ESPN. And while he was with ESPN. All this stuff came out and trickled down. That this happened. All these emails happened between 2011 and 2018. That showed me a man who was all into the isms and phobias, right? And a lot of the people, if you dabble in the racism, you probably dabble in the sexism. You probably dabble in the homophobia. Probably goes all together. I don't think it's much separate. You just have hate in your heart, and that's what it is, right? But And Gruden, last thing I'll say is he basically pieces out, and it's just like, I'm sorry if I, you know, if I offended anybody. Doesn't talk about changing. Doesn't talk about being better. Why not? He doesn't because he doesn't have to. He walks away. He's made millions of dollars. And basically what he did is like, you know what? Shit got hot. I don't want to deal with this anymore. I'm out. That, that right there, folks, Woo! that's the epitome of wealth and white privilege. I think, well, you knocked that out of the park for one. So I don't have much to add. I will say this, though. It's one of those things where the signs were kind of always there in ways that I didn't really piece together because I wasn't really thinking about, like, I don't spend a lot of time thinking about John Gruden, period, right? Like, I just don't sit around thinking about this dude or whatever, whether he was an announcer or a head coach of the Raiders. But then you start to see some pieces coming out, some really good ones, one in particular that I'll highlight by Roger Sherman of The Ringer, uh, talked about this is who John Gruden always was, and this is something that stood out to me because it's one of those things where it's like, huh, you start realizing little things like he never really had a black quarterback outside of Sean King uh, for a brief period of time, fired a defensive coordinator and spun it as, you know, oh, we allowed him to get head coaching opportunities and then from within promoted a white dude to take that role. This was in the late 90s, early 2000s. Uh, the, the, the trope, I don't have a racial bone in my body. Oh, I didn't even get is, to that. Which oh. is, oh, listen, people are putting out the red flag thing because, you know, social media, every week or so, there's a new trend where people what people are doing with their tweets. They're putting red flags around different quotes and things like that. Somebody saying, especially a white guy, but somebody saying, I don't have a racial bone in my body. Yeah, Come on, like, son. Yeah, that's like, that's like the one where people are like, I don't see color. Red flag. Right, red right. Flag. Red Major. Flag. Those all the red flags should be around there. So those sort of different things, and then like you know, as Dexter said, like once you get to the homophobia and then the anti-women stuff, you could assume that there's some Islamophobia there. I'm surprised he didn't come after our people, but there ain't a lot of us in the NFL to begin with. And what if I told y'all about the God family football theory? You know what I'm saying? Like, there's a lot of football in here. And I'm sure that there's some <laughs> God and family that comes with this, too, with John Gruden. Like, I am positive of that. So, uh, look, there's nothing wrong with God, with family, or football. I'm just saying, if, tho- if, if, those, if those are the three things, you know what I'm saying? Like, if that's the Father, Son, and Holy Spirit for you, then I don't know, bro. Like, that's a little, <laughs> that's a little, that's a little dangerous for, for the average person. But, yeah, you go down the line, and there are just a lot of things here. and. It was like to even see it. I feel like I didn't even see everything because at some point I was just like, I kind of know what this is already. So I don't know if I need to subject myself. But the main thing for me here is the John Gruden stuff. I I think he's done, you know, for the most part. Maybe he pops up again. I don't really care about that necessarily. But this was an investigation about the Washington football team, right, that this came out through. Uh, Jay Gruden, John's brother, was the head coach. and. What I'm wondering is what else is going to come out from here? Because that's where I'm mm-hmm. like, I, as, as Dan Levitar said, when I heard him talk about this, I'm keeping my eye on the ball. 
I want to know what's going to come out from here on out because there were, you know, uh, guys sharing photos of like topless cheerleaders and laughing about it in the emails that I heard Bomani Jones point out that uh, there's just a lot of stuff here, a lot of layers, and there's an obvious level of comfortability with all of these dudes sending from their work emails to each other and just having these conversations with their work email, this, this feeling of being untouchable. And I think that there's going to be a lot to come out of this. So I'm still paying attention to whatever comes out here. I don't know if it's going to be, you know, the New York times or Washington post, whoever, but clearly there are people gunning out for this. And I'm hoping that some good reporting will, you know, get some of this stuff out there in due time, because I came away from this deck feeling like this was just the first major domino to fall of potentially a series of things to come. And if there's not, I'd be surprised because I do think that there there's going to be a lot there that is worth exposing. Yeah, I think there's more. I have no problem with the exposing. If we are going to sort of eradicate these things in our culture and move better, then it has to be the uncomfortability. The people on the other side would be like, oh, well, you got to walk on eggshells. You got to watch what you're going to say. How about not saying dumb shit? How about not saying hate? On your work shit? email. On your, on your, work, on your email. work email. How about doing that? How about getting that hate and dumb stuff out of your heart, like completely? I mean, those people don't want to do it. You hit the nail on the head. It's about the comfortability that people said it. And this is the thing. When I always say this stuff, I always look at like everybody's like, man, John Gruden said that it was horrible. Yeah, it was. But like the other people were there cool with it too. Like they were okay with it. Nobody questioned it. Nobody pushed back. Nobody even pushed back to say, hey, John, yo, could, could we, uh, can we like all respond to this on some other email server or platform? Yeah. No, he, they he don't felt care. good saying it to them yeah, also. Be- because they're so insulated in where they are. This is a league with only three black head coaches, right? There's never been a black owner in the National Football League, majority owner in the National Football League. This is a league that has had a litany of problems. What they're going to do moving forward and how serious they are is really going to be interesting. But I do think it's time, you know, it, it's time for them to start doing something. This is not just an NFL problem. This is a culture and thing that many minorities, women, and people of the LGBTQ community have to deal with when they're in the workplace. We don't feel like we can be ourselves. We don't feel like we can be authentic. We always feel like that we are being judged because of how we are, how we look, how we present ourselves by the people that have overwhelmingly been oppressive and have held power within this country. This is the problem many people feel like that. And when they see this, what was said to Demora Smith, when they see what was said about these women, when they see what was even said about Roger Goodell and the homophobic insults and slurs that we use, this is why people don't feel comfortable. This is a problem in this country. This is the problem. It's rearing its ugly head. All people of minorities, we all know this is, this has existed and continues to exist. We are not shocked, but it's a new day. And people are going to get exposed. And that's not a bad thing. All right, that's it for this episode. Emergency podcast of the Ain't Hard Stuff podcast, episode 197. Thank you to everybody for supporting us. You got two episodes this week. This week, We'll be back next week with a lot more to talk to you about. Who knows? Might have to do another emergency pod next week. You'll never know. Big shout out to our producer, Gregory Alcala. Check him out on the Sports Walk first episode. Yes. Yeah, talk about the Knicks. How the Knicks future is bright. I believe it is for sure. Also check out Brian, work he's doing with FanDuel. We talked about that in the episode earlier this week. Please support him and do that. And also Hidalgo Heights and stores available for everybody to get now. We're, st- we're starting to get, we got some things coming for that that I'll talk about probably in a couple of different episodes, but some things are picking up a little bit. Absolutely. All right. For Brian Fonseca, I'm Dexter Henry. Until next sure. time, y'all. Peace. Peace.